Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be giving this talk. I'll be talking about thoracic imaging, how to order the optimal imaging study for your patient. My name is Hussam Kaka. I'm a radiology resident at McMaster University in uh, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And the slides that I'm presenting today were made in collaboration with Dr. Danielle Walker, who is a cardiothoracic radiologist uh, at Hamilton General Hospital, where I work. So I will start by saying if there's any feedback that you'd like to give on how this lecture goes, please feel free to email me and there is my email. Now, this talk is going to be a number of questions, multiple choice questions. It's going to be interactive. So I hope by now everybody's had a chance to log into Slido. Please make sure you follow through with the questions. They're not difficult questions, so I hope that it will be fairly uh, reasonable as you go through them. You will find that hopefully they are. Uh, but they are meant as a way to stimulate discussion and thought about how to deal with these presentation. And also, uh, after every question, it'll open up the discussion for why the correct answer is what it is. So without further ado, let's get started. So suppose you are a physician and uh, you are facing this clinical scenario. You have a 70-year-old male, presents to a family doctor's office with a new cough, uh, and has a fever at 38.5 degrees, associated with shortness of breath. He has a history of uh, one pack a day smoking per day for most of his life, but he quit five years ago. Uh, he has left upper lobe crackles. What's the optimal imaging modality? Would it be a PA and lateral chest radiographs, ultrasound chest focused on the left upper lobe, CT chest, MRI chest, or no imaging? Please answer on Slido, you have 30 seconds. All right, so time is up. The correct answer in this case would be PA and lateral chest radiographs. So you do the radiographs and this is what you find. And as you can see, there are a number of findings here. First, we have a hazy opacity in the left mid lung. It silhouettes the left hard border. And we see a very clear demarcation posteriorly on the lateral radiograph. So the upper border is hazy. The anterior border is hazy, but the posterior border is very, very clear. So what we just looked at was consolidation of the left upper lobe. And given the clinical presentation that we had, this would be consistent with pneumonia. So far, straightforward. It's an infection of the lung. It's readily visible on the radiographs. Um, it's important to do a chest radiograph for pneumonia and not only treat clinically because eliminating the chest radiograph will lead to overtreatment. There will be a number of patients who present with fever and shortness of breath who might not have pneumonia on radiograph. These might have viral illness and as such antibiotic treatment would not be beneficial. So when you are suspecting a diagnosis of pneumonia, it's important to confirm this with a chest radiograph. Now, a CT would also demonstrate pneumonia just as well, but it's a more expensive test. It adds significantly more radiation, but minimally extra information. So at this point, a CT is not appropriate. All right, so that same patient Comes, to, comes back to your office six weeks later. He has completed his course of antibiotics as prescribed and now feels much better. He has not experienced a fever since then and his, his vital signs in your office are normal. Auscultation is normal. What imaging, if any, is most appropriate? So would you do a PA and lateral chest radiograph? Would you do an ultrasound of the chest focused on the left upper lobe? Would you do a CT of the chest, MRI of the chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds to answer the question.
Okay, time is up. So the correct answer is, again, PA and lateral chest radiographs. So we'll take the next question and then we'll discuss this. So you do, you do the radiograph. Here I'm showing you only the frontal and you see the following. Uh, this is the repeat at six weeks. Based on this X-ray, uh, what is the next best imaging test, if any? So it'll be another repeat PA and lateral chest radiographs in six weeks from now, or an ultrasound of the chest focused on the left upper lobe, or a CT of the chest, MRI of the chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds to answer the question. Okay, time is up. So the correct answer at this point would be a CT of the chest. And here's why. First off, we have to follow up on pneumonia after treatment. Although a chest x-ray is very, very sensitive to pneumonia, it is not specific. So what that means is it will not miss pneumonia, but there are multiple pathologies that will look the same on the x-ray. So an X-ray that looks like pneumonia might be pneumonia or might be something else. Community-acquired pneumonia typically resolves in a matter of days with the appropriate treatment, but it takes weeks for radiographic resolution. And so it's important to wait some time after treatment and after resolution before repeating the radiograph. Repeating the radiograph about a week after the initial diagnosis is useless. It's probably going to look exactly the same. Typically, we recommend six weeks, but the minimum period that you have to wait is four weeks. So you astutely caught that there is a rounded mass in the left upper lung zone. It is surrounded by a hazy opacity, which looks like some consolidation. And you're quite concerned that six weeks after the initial presentation, the expected pneumonia has not entirely resolved. So you ordered the chest CT, and here is a lung window of the chest CT. All right, so based on this imaging finding, let's see what we're going to do. And there is an axial image. So this is a coronal image in lung window, and this is an axial, and you can see the findings. All right, so this is what we just talked about. Pneumonia should resolve after six weeks. If it does not resolve, it's not pneumonia, and that's why we do a CT. So a radiologist reviewed the images and is concerned about the findings. They found a speculated mass in the left upper lobe. What should the radiologist recommend at this point? Would it be an ultrasound of the chest focused on the left upper lobe? Will it be a repeat CT chest in one year? Will it be an image-guided lung biopsy? Will it be an MRI chest? Or will it be a PET CT? You have 30 seconds. Okay, time is up. So we actually have two correct answers at this point. You can do an image-guided lung biopsy or a PET CT, and we'll talk about that. So here's a PET CT. So on the left, we have a conventional CT scan, and on the right, we have a PET scan overlaid on CT for the same patient. What PET does for us is we inject a radioisotope, radio-labeled glucose, that's the FDG part, and um, look for radioactivity in anatomical locations in the patient. Tumors are typically hypermetabolic, so they're going to uptake glucose, including radioactive glucose, at much higher rate than the surrounding tissues. And that's exactly what we see here. So you see this overlay in red corresponding to a high concentration of the radioactive glucose. So we can tell that this tissue is actually highly metabolizing, raising suspicion for a tumor. So that's PET. 
Alternatively, we could also do a biopsy. So this is a CT-guided biopsy of the mass. You can see the needle coming in uh, well aimed at the mass itself, and this is a single CT slice uh, showing that. So the question is, before I move on to case two, the question is, when would you pick PET versus a biopsy? And that's going to depend on a number of factors. First, availability. Which one's more available? Which one's more accessible? Which one's cheaper? Oftentimes, the biopsy is cheaper. The second thing that's important to consider is patient wishes and future management. So a patient who wishes to have radical treatment or resection will need a biopsy. You need to get tissue samples and diagnose the underlying type of tumor. If a patient prefers palliative care or no intervention, or if a patient has severe comorbidities and is not a surgical candidate, then you want to go for the conservative option and do an FDG PET, save them the agony and pain of a biopsy. So both options are appropriate, but depending on which pathway you're going to take aggressive versus conservative management, you're going to choose between FDG, PET-CT, or a CD-guided biopsy. All right, moving on to our second case. So you have a 21-year-old male who presents to your emergency department with acute shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. He says this started suddenly and progressed quickly over the past 25 minutes. He has tachypnea at 22 respir respirations per minute, but is otherwise stable. You examine him and find normal breath sounds. Is it a chest radiograph, ultrasound chest, CT chest, MRI chest, or none of the above? You have 30 seconds. Okay, time is up. The correct answer is a chest radiograph. So you asked for it, we have done it for you, and there it is, you can see it on the screen. So look at this image, and we're gonna ask a question based on this. All right, so the question is, the chest radiograph shown on the previous slide was determined to be normal. Yet given this presentation, you're still concerned. What would you do? Repeat chest radiograph, inspiratory phase chest radiograph, expiratory phase chest radiograph, CT chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds. I'll show you the image once again, but we know that it's normal. Okay, time is up. So the correct answer at this point would be an expiratory phase chest radiograph. So here we are, we've got an inspiratory view on the left and an expiratory view on the right. It's probably difficult to see via zoom, so let's, uh, let's enhance. We're gonna look at the lung apices. We're gonna look very carefully at the lung apices. Do you notice anything? So as you can see, there's an edge within the thoracic cavity that's clearly demarcated. Lateral to this edge, we have a slightly darker thoracic cavity and absent lung markings. And in fact, if we look at the inspiratory view, that edge is once again visible, but much harder to see. It overlaps bone and it's closer to the chest wall. So we have a pneumothorax. And in cases where we suspect a pneumothorax, we don't need to go to expensive imaging. Simply repeating the x-ray in expiratory views can be very, very helpful. 
This is because the thoracic cage moves in between inspiration and expiration, and it changes the configuration of the collapsed lung. It might make the lung edge more de detectable. Note that basically all of our x-rays under normal circumstances with cooperative patients are done in inspiration. So doing an inspiratory phase view doesn't really, isn't different in any way from a normal x-ray. It's the expiratory view that's not done unless specifically asked for. So in summary, if you're worried about a pneumothorax and you're not sure that you see one, ask to repeat the x-ray during expiration. All right, here's our next um, question. You have a different 21-year-old who presents with pleuritic chest pain and tachycardia. You order a radiograph that you see on the slide in front of you. What imaging should you order next? Repeat chest radiograph, expiratory phase chest radiograph, ultrasound chest, CT chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds to answer the question. Okay, time is up. And the correct answer is none of the above. So let's talk about this before we move on. There are a few findings on this x-ray. First, we notice that there's completely absent lung markings on the right side of the chest. We notice that there is deviation of the trachea in this intubated patient. So this is a pneumothorax. It's a very large pneumothorax. But more importantly, we're noticing that the entire mediastinum, so you see this is the midpoint of the spine. These are the spinous processes overlying the vertebral body. So that's the patient's midline. And you can see that the trachea is shifted to the left. You can see the entire heart is shifted to the left. In fact, the entire mediastinum is shifted to the left. We can see that the right diaphragm is pushed inferiorly in comparison to the left. From these findings, we can immediately tell that there's a buildup of pressure on the right side of the, of the lung. There's also poor aeration on the left lung due to poor expansion. So when you see these findings, the answer should not be more imaging. What this is really is a tension pneumothorax. Normally, when you have a pneumothorax, you have leakage of air into the pleural space, as we all know. It's typically caused by a defect in the pleura. Sometimes you can have a specific type of defect in the pleura that leads to buildup of tension. So every time you inspire, air comes in. But then on expiration, air does not come out. It becomes a one-way valve. And so with every breath that is taken in, the pneumothorax grows and grows and grows. In the end, you end, up with, um, you end up with cardiac arrest due to decreased venous return to the heart. So it's an emergency, and the diagnosis has been made. There is no need for further imaging. It's time to treat. Um, typically, we treat with urgent decompression. Chest tube is the standard of care. It's the ideal. But in an emergency setting where the skin the, the, the equipment, the skills, or the sterile environment is not available for a chest tube, then a needle thoracostomy can also be done. All right. So let's do the next case. You have a 40-year-old male with a symptomatic right inguinal hernia who is scheduled for surgical repair. As part of his preoperative physical examination in your general surgery clinic, he's found to have stable vital sounds and a normal thoracic physical exam. What imaging, if any, is most appropriate? Chest radiograph, ultrasound of the chest, CT of the chest, MRI of the chest, or none of the above? You have 30 seconds. Okay, time is up. 
So the correct answer is once again, none of the above. Now, here's another one. You have a 77 year old male patient with multiple myeloma with a pathologic fracture of the right femur and is scheduled for surgical repair. As part of, it, as part of his preoperative physical examination, he's found to have stable vital signs and no cardiopulmonary concerns. What imaging, if any, is most appropriate? A chest radiograph, an ultrasound of the chest, a CT of the chest, an MRI of the chest, or none of the above? You have 30 seconds. Okay, time's up. The correct answer in this case is chest radiograph. So let's talk about this. So preoperative chest radiography in otherwise healthy individuals is generally not indicated. It's generally not needed. But sometimes if there are patient or procedure related factors which increase risk, then preoperative chest radiography should be considered. The American College of Radiology recommends that chest radiography be considered in patients who have advanced age, defined as age over 70 years, patients who have unreliable history and physical examination, and patients who are undergoing high-risk surgery. So you do the radiograph, and here are the findings. Do you, see, do you see anything abnormal? There's no question for this on Slido, but maybe take 20 seconds or so to see if you can spot the abnormality before we point it out. So you can see that I've actually changed the brightness and the contrast to sort of exclude all the soft tissues in the mediastinum. We're really, I'm trying to highlight for you that the abnormality is in the lung. And if we look carefully, and I'm not expecting you to be able to see that very clearly on Zoom, but, uh, but on a PAX workstation, we could actually see that there is this finding. It's a nodule in the right lower lung. And this is an important finding. So the radiograph shown previously was noted by the radiologist to have a one centimeter nodule in the right lower lung zone. What should the radiologist recommend? Repeat chest radiograph in six months, ultrasound of the chest, CT of the chest, MRI of the chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds. All right, time is up. The correct answer at this point is a CT of the chest. So you do the CT and you find this. It confirms the presence of the nodule. We don't see other nodules. So this is a solitary pulmonary nodule. Sometimes we see it on imaging incidentally. There is a you know, a classic differential diagnosis for these, and it includes benign and malignant pathologies. So under benign, we would be considering granulomas, hamartomas, fibromas. Under malignant, we would be considering metastases, especially hematologic metastases, as well as lung cancer. Uh, it's important to investigate these nodules because of the risk that they might be malignant. So typically, when we find a lung nodule, the initial assessment is done with a CT. As soon as we identify a lung nodule, we request a CT. It's able to characterize the nodules better. It can find other nodules elsewhere, and it can detect findings that suggest benign disease. So for example, the pattern of calcification. X-rays are not sensitive for uh, lung nodules, and they often miss lung nodules. So if that's the suspicion, X-ray is really not the right test. So following the CT, management depends on the imaging features. 
based on what it looks like on imaging, we might recommend a lung biopsy, PET CT, or a biopsy via bronchoscopy if it's central and close to the bronchi and the blood vessels. Or if we think it's benign, we might recommend just follow-up CT after some time. We also want to know the patient's condition. Are they going to pursue treatment? We'll recommend a biopsy. Are they going to prefer conservative management, watchful waiting? Then we'll recommend a PET CT. Here are some examples of some nodules. So um, we look for things like the size of the nodule. Typically, bigger is worse. We look for the borders of the nodule. So for example, this one here has speculated margins, and it looks fairly concerning. There are also areas of what we call cavitation. So you see small black areas. Those are air-filled components. We call these cavities. Um, we look at whether or not there's calcification. So you can see here there are areas of calcification. Uh, so this would be popcorn calcification, and it'll be typically benign. Here's another one. You see the entire nodule is calcified. That's also a good sign. Those are typically benign. Here you see more fluffy, small calcifications, and these ones are much more concerning. So based on what the calcification pattern looks like, what the borders look like, what the size, and whether or not there are enlarged lymph nodes downstream will give us an idea of whether we're dealing with something malignant or benign. But our ability to differentiate on CT alone is limited. It's only in special cases that we can tell for sure. Oftentimes, we need the biopsy. All right, so let's do a new case. So during your work in the emergency department, you see a 53-year-old woman who presents with shortness of breath. Her symptoms have been progressing over the past few days, and she now has fever at 38 degrees. She has a history of breast cancer and has had bilateral mastectomies five years ago. What imaging, if any, is most appropriate? Chest radiograph, ultrasound chest, CT chest, MRI chest, or none of the above? You have 30 seconds. Okay, time is up. And the correct answer is a chest radiograph, the first line imaging modality in this case. So you do the radiograph, and this is what it looks like. So I'll give you a little bit of time. Just take your time and see what you can make out in terms of the findings. All right, so there's a few important findings here. First, we're seeing this very clear, well-defined edge with an opacity lateral to it. So this looks like fluid at pleural effusion. We're also seeing increased opacity of the left lung as well as decreased aeration, decreased lung volume. So we're seeing adjacent collapse slash atelectasis. Uh, this, is, this is probably the upper lobe, and it's probably the lower lobe that is most collapsed or has the most atelectasis. We're also seeing the diaphragm nicely on the right, but the diaphragm silhouetted on the left, and that will also confirm to us that there is probably fluid and that the left lower lobe is collapsed and or consolidated. All right, notice the shape of this. So if this patient's upright, which this patient is upright, we're seeing the fluid go up all the way to the pulmonary apex, and it forms almost like a ball-like figure here, and then, and then the curve goes linearly. It's not typical for what a pleural effusion should look like. So let's do the next question. As you examine the radiograph, you notice something unusual. Parts of the pleural fluid are located at the apex and are not layering dependently. You are considering a chest tube, but you're not sure if a chest tube is able to drain the entire collection. What imaging test, if any, is the best next step? Chest radiograph, ultrasound chest, CT chest, MRI chest, or none of the above? You have 30 seconds.
Okay, time is up. So we actually have two correct answers in this point. First, let's observe that the fact that the pleural fluid is located at the apex and is not layering dependently tells us that this is probably a loculated effusion. It has multiple septations and loculations. If we're trying to examine a loculated effusion, we can do an ultrasound of the chest and a CT of the chest. So let's talk more about that. Here's an ultrasound of the chest showing a pleural effusion. Now, ultrasound would be a bit of a, a little bit different as a modality, but really what we're looking for for fluid is this black space. Fluid is typically dark on ultrasound. The lung is not clearly seen on ultrasound when it's air filled, but when it collapses or becomes consolidated, it can be seen. So here we're seeing parts of the lung. So this is lung here, this is also lung. But importantly, we're seeing this pleural effusion. This is a sagittal view, and there's the diaphragm. Without getting too much into ultrasound, what I really want to point out to you is that this is a simple pleural effusion that is entirely black. On the right side, on the other hand, this is what we call a loculated effusion. So you can see, first, the fluid is not as dark anymore. There is content in this fluid. This could be proteinaceous material, hemorrhage, pus, inflamed fluid. Uh, it could be a number of things, but it's not simple fluid. It's not as black. We also see all these echogenic lines. So these are septations, creating little pockets inside the fluid. So we've marked them with S. This is what a loculated effusion looks like on ultrasound. And it's important to identify loculated effusions because they're difficult to drain. If you put a pleural drain into this effusion, you can drain the whole thing with one chest tube. If you put a drain here, you'll only drain a few uh, of the loculations, but the majority of it will probably stay intact. When you see this and it needs draining, this is probably when it's time to ask for help from a surgeon. So um, pleural effusions, this is basically what we talked about, can be simple, simple and loculated. It's important to identify whether we're dealing with a simple or a loculated one, and ultrasound is excellent. CT can also help. Uh, it can demonstrate areas of the pleural effusion that are not um, dependent and not going down through gravity, but ultrasound is probably the cheaper and easier test. All right, and this is our last case. So you have a 67-year-old male who presents to your office for progressively worsening shortness of breath. His exercise tolerance has worsened over the past 12 months. He's now unable to complete a sentence while walking and can no longer jog for any period of time. He has no fever or weight loss. What is the best, uh, sorry, what imaging, if any, is most appropriate? So chest radiograph, ultrasound chest, CT chest, MRI chest, or none of the above. You have 30 seconds. Okay, and time's up. So the correct answer is chest radiograph. It's commonly the first line imaging modality. You do the radiograph and you see this. So take a few seconds and see if you can identify any of the findings, anything that strikes you the most. All right, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it as it might be not projecting super well on Zoom. So the most striking finding really is the uh, interstitium of the lung. You see all these small septae and all these darker, almost cyst-like appearance at the bases of the lungs. It looks fairly normal at the apices, but more so at the lungs. This is a fairly subtle finding. If you see it, wonderful. If you don't see it, you could even call it normal at least acutely normal, but chronically like a radiologist should not call this normal. Okay, so in the absence of an infectious cardiovascular or malignant etiology for the patient's progressive shortness of breath, you worry about the possibility of a chronic interstitial lung disease and wish to assess for this possibility. So what imaging, if any, is most appropriate? A repeat chest radiograph in six weeks, 
ultrasound chest, CT of the chest, MRI of the chest, or none of the above? So you have 30 seconds to answer this question. Okay, time is up. So the correct answer at this point is a CT of the chest. Here is the x-ray and here is the CT. And on the CT, you can see it confirms the presence of these peripheral, predominantly basal cysts with perceptible walls. So they have thin walls, but, but they definitely do have walls. And you can see them layering. So there's the pleura and there's a few layers of cysts. There's one, there is two. Here we have one, two, three, four. So this is a finding on high resolution CT that we call honeycombing, which is a characteristic sign for interstitial lung disease. ILD is a wide spectrum of lung disease. It results in decreased pulmonary function. It has many causes, including smoking, occupational exposures, inflammatory conditions. The changes can be occult on chest, radio uh, chest radiography, so we might not see them. But high resolution CT chest is the best imaging modality to assess those. So if you do a chest X-ray and you don't see much and you're worried about this, it's very, very appropriate to order a CT chest. So in summary, um, we've gone through a number of exercises. I hope these were useful to cover some of the important uh, concepts in thoracic imaging that you probably see on a frequent basis. Um, Chest radiography is a quick, cheap, and accessible imaging modality that's very valuable for thoracic imaging, and it's important to know thoracic anatomy. Definitely develop an approach for assessing chest radiograph, um, and know that it's often the first step in many pathologies. They do have some limitations, for example, in the assessment of pulmonary nodules, which, and also will add interstitial lung disease, and in both of these cases, it's reasonable to request a CT. Here are some of the sources for the cases that I've shown you. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was useful. If you have any feedback, please feel free to uh, send me an email.